Hi folks and welcome to Tech Talk. My name is Anu. My guest today is Ken Goldman. From 2012 to 2017, Ken served as the Chief Financial Officer at Yahoo. It was during his time that Yahoo undertook some major overhauls and ended up getting acquired by Verizon for $4.8 billion. Come join me as we get to know Ken Goldman. Hi, Ken. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, so great to invite me. Yeah, it's great to have <laughs> you here. Um, so Where are we? We're in Menlo Park. We're in Menlo Park, California, <laughs> right. yes, at your offices. Yes. So um, I'd like to start with, uh, well, first of all, you are one of the senior most finance executives in the tech industry. Over the past 40 years. Well, means I've been around for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Over the past 40 years or so, you have... Um, uh, uh, managed financial operations in several leading companies, mm -hmm. and you have participated in some of the highest profile initiatives in the tech industry in recent years. But I'd like to focus on your tenure at Yahoo from 2012 to 2017. While you were at Yahoo, um, Yahoo took on some massive mm -hmm. strategic overhauls, right? You, uh, Yahoo acquired more than 50 companies worth mm -hmm. $3 billion and more. Um, there was the unraveling of the company stake in Alibaba, and then there was dealing with the um, challenges of the activist shareholder, and uh, then the then the fight then the company was acquired by Verizon for 4.8 billion. During your time at Yahoo, you worked with Marissa Mayer. I'd like to go back to 2012. What was it that led you to accept the role of chief financial officer at Yahoo? Well, it's interesting, that job, like every job I've had, except for one, came out of the blue. Um, Marissa had talked to a number of people, some banker friends, some legal folks that she knew well, uh, Larry Sonsini, for example, and some great banker friends. Talked to some of the board members. And interesting enough, at least what she told me, maybe it wasn't true, but she told me everyone came up with my name. And so, uh, so she, she called me out of the blue, and I remember I was in Maui at the time, and said, Ken, I'm looking for uh, a CFO, and I, I knew of her, but hadn't met her. And I said, sure, I'd love to meet you, Marissa. Uh, so we had a number of meetings. I had a number of uh, meetings with the board. And I said, and, and what attracted me, one is I had been in another internet company before, at Home Network, late 90s, and we helped usher, we helped, helped usher, can I say it right, the, the cable broadband uh, business. So actually, if you go back to 95, 96, Everything was, everyone was AOL, you had a, you di the dial up, whatever. So we helped create uh, the broadband industry and we were one of the really early companies at the co time with uh, Netscape. And so I always said if I had an opportunity to get back into the internet industry, I would. Uh, I felt, uh, I, I remember when Yahoo was, was uh, being uh, solicited by, uh, to get acquired by Microsoft, so I knew a lot about the company. Um, I felt I could, I, I actually felt I had some ideas as to how to improve upon the company. Uh, so uh, it's an iconic company and in a, in a significant company, a Fortune 500 company. And so I said, I leapt at the opportunity. I said, geez, I, I have some ideas. I knew it, it needed a lot of operational work and you know, Marissa is going to work on the culture. But I knew we needed to do a lot of operational work from an expenses point of view and, and hiring and so forth. And, and I worked a lot on my team, by the way. Uh, and so I thought I could be really helpful in terms of the operational and spending cash flow, balance sheet, uh, which was areas I really enjoy because I'm, I'm very internally focused. I really, were, I, I, when I looked at my team, by the way, I looked at the team, I had way too many direct reports. I had, you know, redundancy in my direct reports. Um, actually, one of the things, and I'll actually bring this up, but you didn't ask, but I take a lot of credit uh, of my, I, I inherited something like 13 people. Uh, I, a few left, uh, some I, I let go, some went on their own. I, my group was 10 people when I left. Seven of those were people I inherited. Many of those people were there 10, 12, 15 years. And so what I take a lot of credit in, so to speak, I don't like that word, but uh, is that I was able to re retain some very, very good people. And we had very, very good people there. Uh, I hired three people that worked for me before. And by the way, that's one of the important things about me is I'm able to attract people that have worked for me before to work for me again. Uh, and, and so, as a matter of fact, today, interestingly enough, I'm going to a going away party uh, for a very senior person at Yahoo. He's leaving. And I'm, I, I got invited by one of my people that works for me in finance. 
said, Ken, you want to come over? And I said, yep. So, yeah, I'm, so I'm actually this afternoon going to go to Yahoo and go, go to a going away party for this particular individual, very senior person. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, that's a little bit long-winded as to why I went to Yahoo is I felt it was, we, we, we wanted to transform the company. Yeah, it took us a little longer and I wish we had stayed independent and that, that could be for another time we go through that. But um, it was a very iconic company, as I said. Uh, I felt it, was, it needed some operational work, which is what I wanted to go do. Um, I, I like building teams, and so I, I felt I could do that in terms of my finance team. And, uh, and again, I take a lot of you know, satisfaction, a better way of saying it, a lot of satisfaction in that seven of the, ten fo seven of the folks uh, that, were w that were working with me at the end were people I inherited and have been at Yahoo 10 plus years. And the fact that it, keeping them excited about it and having them work for me and feeling good about working for me yeah. is something I really take a lot of pro pride in, in terms sure. of Yahoo. Sure. This is a loaded question. Oh. Talk about the transformation You told me we wouldn't Yahoo. have any loaded questions. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the transformation of Yahoo. Well, I think we did many things well. Um, I think, you know, and I've used that actually in other situations when I've gone in. Uh, as I th even thought of thinking about here, one of the first things we wanted to do, well, I'll get, well it was actually four things. One was think about the culture. Uh, one was thinking about the products. One was thinking about the expenses. And one was thinking about our cash flow and balance sheet. So we really went through all four things. Let me talk. So culture, uh, Marissa did, I think, a fabulous job. Just an absolutely fabulous job. It was a company before she got there in which employees didn't want to work there. We couldn't. We, you mentioned um, we acquired all these companies, a lot of them we call aqua hire companies. Uh, we couldn't acquire anyone before she got there. No one wanted to come work for Yahoo. So she created an environment where it was conducive. We, it was a very transparent environment. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, we created, uh, she created, uh, we, uh, transparency, she created a weekly meeting, all hands meeting every Friday at 4.30. By the way, everyone told her don't do it at 4.30 on Friday. There won't be anybody there. Do it on Wednesday or Thursday. And she said, no, we're going to do it Friday. We're going to do it Friday every week. And we did it for every, all five years I was there. She may be in five years that we were collectively there, miss maybe half dozen. In five years, think about it, on Fridays, 4.30. She wanted to have that as a way we, she would communicate. And so what did she do? We, we had some various presentations, uh, which we would go through various update presentations. She might update what the board said about something. Uh, she may have a new product release we would talk about. So she would have various new marketing uh, program, whatever. So we would have about, of the hour, about half hour to 40 minutes would be presentations. Um, and, uh, and by the way, she would introduce all the new employees. So that was actually the very first thing we would do. And then the last 20 minutes was Q&A. And all of us on staff would come up and meet with her. So we'd all be with her and we'd do live Q&A. And Q&A in terms of, that we actually had a moderate approach and which, you know, in terms of up down, but I won't go through that right now. So we did Q&A. So that was one of the ways we had transparency. Every Friday we did that. Uh, she, we had, every month we had leadership meetings with the VPs. We'd go through a little bit more sensitive matters. So we created a transparent culture. We looked at various things to make the place better. So we, we improved, the, we, we, we did something called UV where we improved all, most of our offices. So we were all across the world, really updated our, our offices. We created, you know, amenities like, you know, Yahoo was one of the very only internet companies that didn't have free food. You might think it's a little, minor, but you're competing for talent with Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. And, so, and we had this crazy thing where it cost you for food, we subsidize it, it would take you more time to get in and out of the turnstile to pay for it than it did to get your food. And so we, we eliminated that, it had great food, great healthy food. Um, we created something, well guess what, mobile was important. We had almost no mobile participation when we got there. So we created a program where everyone got a phone. Could be an Android, could be a, an Apple, we didn't, we didn't care. Uh, we created where everyone had you know, up, eight updated laptops. So we, again, we created a whole bunch of these things that were really cultural, you know, in, in terms of making the transparency well, the amenities, nice offices, nice, you know, benefits, if you will. Uh, we, we changed the paternity, maternity leaves. We changed all, we looked at all of these things. Um, then, as I said, if you want to cover it, you know, we did, we looked at expenses. We get, came there, we had, seven, I think, something like 17,000 employees. It was way, way too much. So over the years, over the five years, we, we got the headcount down to about 9,000. We reduced 
uh, expenses by 20%. So we really worked and we went, we used benchmarking. We, we can, uh, I'll co cover that a little bit more later. And we did a lot in the balance sheet, which again, I'll cover a little bit more later. But we really worked hard and I would say uh, one of the real benefits, and by the way, um, as I think about it, she's an engineer, engineer. Um, so she, she, even to the extent somebody's a little bit nerdy, she loves to get in engineering projects. And so we, it, it, by the importance is that we were able to attract great engineers. We were not doing that before she got there. So we all of a sudden, you know, we made it so the engineers were really key, they're very important. Uh, and we, she was able to attract many, many great engineers. Some we, we just hired, some we did through the aqua hires, which you brought up, brought up before in terms of these acquisitions. Yeah. But we, we made it an inviting culture for engineers, which wasn't the case under prior administrations. I see. Interesting. So you have the reputation for being operationally inclined and being extremely effective when it comes to cost saving. How specifically did you apply this experience at Yahoo? So yeah, it's funny. Different CFOs have things that interest them, and I'm pretty good at investor relations, but frankly, I would much rather be internally focused. So I did spend, you know, it's funny, people go through what the percentage of time, I probably spent 90% of my time internally versus 10% externally. Uh, we had a great investor relations person uh, and a great group there. So I, I spent more of my time operationally, which I, again, I like mixing it up with the engineers and with the, you know, IT folks and with the marketing folks and sales. It's, it's just what interests me. Um, in this case, it was, we have a very large organization. As I said before, we had like set some, something like 17,000 employees. 3,000 of those were contractors. Just, uh, we had offices all over the world, way too many offices. Uh, we actually closed out, I think, something like 28 offices. Another example is we had our headquarters in Europe and um, Geneva. Why Geneva? Because the, the CEO of Europe wanted to uh, live in Geneva. Do we have any business in Switzerland? Zero. So we give an example. We moved it to Dublin. Um, we actually brought in, and you know, and you know, I've been allowed to say this. We brought in McKinsey. Uh -huh. uh, we did benchmarking, and I and I'm a big fan of benchmarking. So we we went through all the various areas we had, and it turns out one of the big areas that we were out of sync was in the G&A administration area, uh, whether it's finance, HR, legal, uh, customer support for that matter, uh, way out of, so we use, uh, and the nice thing about benchmarking when you use someone like McKinsey is what they do is they give you best practices and they benchmark you against other companies. So in t instead of different organizations, organizations say, gee, that, that makes no sense, that you, you give them, you show them data, here's how, HR for our size company should be run. Here's how you know the finance organization, and even within my finance, here's how finance FP&A should be run, and here's how accounting should be run. So we, we went and got benchmark best practice data, and we used that to drive expenses. And for, I'll give you an example. We took G&A down from uh, almost 11% of, of um, our revenue to like about eight, eight or eight and a half. So we took two percent, over two points of G&A percent of revenue, to, and, and half of that, over half of that came from, from the, my finance area. So we really looked, and again, some of it came out of real estate. We had way too many offices. We didn't need all these offices. So I, the, the lesson learned is to use benchmarking, use an outside firm to go look at what are the best practices. In my own area, not only we use McKinsey, I did, did some work with Deloitte, and they actually went, really did fine tune some of the key functions we had so they could actually look at tax, for example, and treasury and really look at where we could save money. And again, when you look at hard data, as opposed to your know, anecdotes, it really opens up people's eyes as what the opportunity is. And I, I think I actually went through this in some numbers. We actually reduced my headcount in finance. Well, we grew the company from four and a half to five billion, and we reduced headcount in finance from like 400 people to 300 people roughly, in the same time frame. I see, very interesting, okay. Um, as a finance person, how do you manage to stay grounded when you're surrounded by all these excitable visionaries? Well, it's, it's what ke it's kept me going for, Christ, 40 years, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, people have said, Ken, you've worked for some crazy people. I, I've worked for folks like uh, Al Stein, early days, and Tom Siebel, and, and Marissa, and Tom Drill. It's a very, very hard hardworking folks. Uh, actually, I almost said something else, but I'll say, and, and so, and I, I love that actually. I, I love people that are just passionate, really focused on their business. Um, and and I'm an engineer at heart. I actually have an undergraduate degree in engineering, so I like working with the engineering folks and, and projects and, and products and innovation. It's what really drives me. It's drive, it drives me in terms of my boards that I go on. Drives me in terms of my investments I make. 
So that's what really gets me excited is working with, with fun people. As I say, when we would go through, Merce would have these weekly staff meetings and we'd go through products and so forth, it was really interesting and I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, and another thing that I could have brought up before, you know, interesting enough, we didn't have a policy that we had to use our own products first before we introduced it to the outside world. So believe it or not, we were not using our, our Yahoo email, we were using someone else's email. Uh, you know, and so Marissa said, we, you know, we're going to use, we had a separate corporate email. So they said, nope, we're going to use the same email that our users use so we can actually see what they see. We're going to see the same ads they see. Uh, and so we, we created, uh, she created a policy that we will use our own products first before we introduce it externally. And so that was one of the things. But, you know, the, the thing I liked about Yahoo, it, it particularly liked, you know, it really affected our daily lives. You think about, you know, I still use you know, finance. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a sports addict, so I like bringing up the sports, uh, sports app. Um, you know, I st you still use Yahoo email. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I wasn't as much in, in news and, and lifestyles as the other four, uh, four verticals we had, part of the four verticals we had. So I, I, I'm not, I get my news otherwise. But, but yeah, the finance and sports, I mean, they're just part and parcel of how we think. And so, uh, so it was really fun to think about as we were adding enhancements to these products, you know, including email. We made tons of, people said you couldn't do anything in the email. We made tons of improvements in our email. And it, it became a very, very good product, you know, a product that was right behind Google in terms of uh, usage. So we, we did great, I thought, great job there, uh, great job improving finance. And, you know, it's interesting, too, as I think back, uh, you try to do improvements you find out some people like the old, some, you know, some people appreciate the new. And there's always a balance as to how much new do you bring on because people get wedded to what you had before yeah. and yet you got to keep moving. And so it was always a balance. But the nice thing about Yahoo, you, a couple of things. You ask people about Yahoo, everyone knows the company. Yes. You know, everyone knows the company. And the other thing is, even more so, I would say, at least when we left, you ask people what they think of Yahoo, even versus some of the other companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, whatever, I would say everyone loves Yahoo. Yeah. It's one of those companies where, you know, no matter what you think in some areas, people really did like Yahoo as a company yeah. and the products. And that was something that would really kept us together and kept us excited is how the love people had for Yahoo as a company and for our products. Sure. What do you look at before you go to work at a company? I mean in terms of before I take the job? Yeah, before you take the job, yeah. Um, you know, it's hard because, uh, you, know, you know, if you're on a board, you can go on a number of boards, but you only work for one company. Yeah. And, and so I have, other than one situation, uh, every, one situation I had a recruiter recruit me, so to speak, every other situation came like the, the Marissa, where she calls me, you know, when I went to Fournet, one of the board members introduced me to the company. Uh, when I went to Tom Siebel Systems, uh, it was Tom called me. Um, I actually, you know, a couple of things. One is I do happen to like generally working for founders. So I like working with Tom when he, because he was a founder of Siebel. I like working with Ken Z. He was a founder of Fortinet. Um, we had some founding members that were at, at Home Network. Uh, Marissa clearly wasn't the founder of Yahoo, but I just thought it's such an amazing company. It touches all of our lives. And the, the, the leverage we would have if we could really improve the company uh, would be immense. And so, you know, a lot of it's very subtle. Um, and instinct, for me, it's instinctual. When I see when I, something that looks right to me in terms of who's running a company, can I add value? Because if I can't add value, there's no reason to be there. So I like to, be, I like to feel like they want me. Uh, that's really important. So if, if they're really engaging and re trying to recruit me, uh, as opposed to me trying to force myself on someone, I don't, like don't want to force myself. I like when someone says, hey, Ken, we have this opportunity. We really, we really need you to come here. And then, you know, and frankly, I let the other chips fall as they may in terms of the, uh, you know, compensation and stuff. But it's really when someone says, hey, we need some help. You know, when I went to Fortinet, you know, they had tried to go public for a number of years, couldn't do it. Uh, they had a business model that was, wasn't working and they really needed help. And the, the board said, and, you know, and, and Ken Z needs some help. And the board said, geez, Ken, we really, we really need your help here. And we took it public and it was something that was really, really important to the company. Uh, so it's, it's partly when I feel that I'm wanted and I'm needed and I can add value. Sure, sure. How do you think of your role as CFO? Well, um, you know, 
Everyone, I, I'm, you, uh, you talked about before, I'm operationally focused. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I look at my role as, can I be a sounding board to CEO? Uh, can I do some of the things? You know, a lot of times CEO, particularly in technology companies, which I'm in, involved in, the CEO wants to, really focuses on two main areas. CEOs love to talk about products and engineering, and they like to talk about sales and how you sell. And so my goal is to take much of the other stuff away so the C CEO does not have to worry about those things. So that's part of how I think. I like to be a sounding board. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm, I, I call a spade a spade. I'm not political. I don't have a bias. I don't have an agenda. So I want the CEO to feel that they can come to me, he or she can come to me and, and get my advice in an unbiased, unvarnished uh, way. That's always how I've always thought about uh, working at, at companies. Uh, and that was how I thought about going to Yahoo, is, it, <clears throat> is how I could be a, <clears throat> a sounding board for Marissa. She wanted to think about things, and uh, again, I have the utmost, utmost respect for her. I'd work for her again in a second in terms of <clears throat> working for her. You know, because she, you know, the other thing is it's really important that I'm, uh, you know, I have a lot of discretion and, and, and I don't have people micromanaging me. And, and by the way, I do the same thing. I don't want to micromanage my folks. So in terms of my own folks, I want people that I'm working with that, frankly, can... Um, really, uh, man they can manage for themselves, they just need some direction, but I don't want to micromanage people anymore. I want people working with me at a very a senior level, and, and same thing, I don't want my CEO micromanaging me. Uh, I think I have a good idea what my job and role is and how I can help, and, and I like to be let to do that, and so that's how I look at CEOs that let me sort of do what I want to do, and that's how, uh, how I've, so to speak, done, I think, reasonably well uh, over the years. Sure. How do you think of CEOs? Um, I've thought long and hard of that, actually. Um, and I've worked for a lot of good ones. Uh, I like CEOs that are, frankly, uh, driven, passionate about the business, um, enduring focused, uh, have great leadership and charismatic uh, skills, uh, are decisive. But actually, I'm going to say something which may surprise you. I like CEOs that can know how to say no. Um, is, is you know this is not a game that you 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 want to be respected but not necessarily loved, uh, which means you got to call a spade a spade. So you may, sometimes you need to make some very hard personnel decisions. You need to sometimes make some very hard expenditure decisions. Mm -hmm. And and I would say without going too far down the road, I've worked for some very good CEOs and, and they know they knew how to say no. There's one CEO uh, that followed Tom Drimlock uh, at, at home, did not, ha did not know how to say no, and I, I would not work for that kind of individual again, uh, because you can't say yes to everything. Um, I like CEOs that don't go where they don't allow people to go around me, because sometimes I'll say no. Uh, if someone disagrees, that's fine, um, but then we get in front of the CEO, and, and Mercer was very good. If someone disagreed on something that I might have done, she would say, fine, let's get everyone together in a room and let's discuss it. Uh, <clears throat> she would not have people go around me. And I, so I re really respected her for the way she, she went about that. But I, interesting enough, you, you're looking for, you know, CEOs. That, and the other thing I should say, the, the strategy of technology companies doesn't come from strategy department, doesn't come from BD, it comes from the CEO. So you need a CEO that really understands where they want to take the company. So they're, the, they're the really the chief visionary, chief strategist, if you will. Uh, and they're the ones that sort of, you need someone can hire as that's really important. That's one of the reasons why I can't be a CEO, in my opinion, of a technology company, because I'm good at hiring a lot of people, but the ability to attract and re the right people, particularly in the engineering, is something a great CEO needs to do in a technology company. So that's why I look for someone who can attract uh, uh, the right level of people and the right and has a good sense of talent uh, at the level. Can hire the salesperson, can hire the head marketing, whatever. So that's so I look for people who can hire the right people. Uh, can make decisive decisions, and I said, uh, I said, Marissa did a fabulous job. Can set the culture, yeah. you know. CEO, the CEO sets the culture of a company, Absolutely. not the finance person, not the HR person, the CEO. That's right. What, in your perspective, is one thing that absolutely kills a CEO? Well, as I said, I think well, there's a couple, three things. One is if you don't get along with the board, yeah, uh, and that's harder and harder in today's world. If you get, if you get, you know, if you get. Um, uh, you know, negative, well, not negative, you get contrary to your board. I think um, investors, you know, it's a fine line in terms of keeping the investors on board and so forth, particularly if you're going through a transformation. You know, so what can kill CEOs is, is, is what do you call, is the board being out of line with the board, being out of line with your investors. 
Um, it's funny, for all the, you know, sometimes we get some criticism at Yahoo, but if you go back and look, that stock was 50 and change when we went there uh, and hadn't moved for three or four years. It was a flat line. Matter of fact, if it was a heart monitor, you'd be dead because there was no movement in that stock. Uh, if you, in the four years, five years we were there, it went from like 15 to 65. And yes, a lot of that was Alibaba. And, and by the way, you mentioned Alibaba earlier. We, that decision was a horrible decision to make in terms of selling. That was not made by us. It was made by our predecessors, to be very clear. That was a dumb decision uh, to sell Alibaba. How do I know? Because you say, in hindsight, the reason I know is because time I looked at who the investors were that bought into Alibaba at the same time we were selling, and they were very good investors, so I, I know it very well. Uh, we actually did something which we don't necessarily get enough credit for, is we were supposed to sell another half of our position at the IPO. We reduced that immensely by something like 120 million shares, so we actually negotiated to sell less than we were uh, supposed to sell in the IPO, and that actually saved shareholders 13, roughly $13 billion. Doesn't even get a lot of press, but we actually, by not selling, as much, by renegotiating the agreement that was designed and developed before we got there, yeah. we saved a shareholder something like $13 billion uh, you know, and, and, and on, a, on a billion, sh basically roughly a billion shares, that's $13, bill $13 per share. I see. Very interesting. So when you look at a resume, what is it that turns you off? That's easy. First thing. First thing. Person can't stay at a job. The very first thing. I look at a resume, <clears throat> and if I see someone has moved every year, two, three years, instantaneously I say no. And, and, and then people always have a lot of excuses. They say, well, you know, I went to, I didn't know the company didn't do this well, and, you know, my boss, you know, I, I don't want to hear those excuses. You know, at some point, if you can't hold a job, you can't find the right place, uh, I don't want you. And so that's the number one thing. I, I can look at a resume very quickly. Um, so the good part I look at a resume is, is success of good companies, being at good companies, uh, showing a sense of accomplishments. Uh, so you're, you're at a company long enough to get something done. Uh, and we're in, in references. I do a lot of reference checking. I do my own reference checking because I know so many people in the Valley, I can call up someone and get a direct reference on someone as opposed to a generic reference. So getting references is very important. But the number one thing turns me off is someone that moves constantly, can't hold a job, and I, I, I instantaneously don't want to be, I, I instantaneously eliminate their job. Sure. I'm sorry, instantaneously said that person's not, not, not the right person for the job. Right, right. Um, what is, uh, what is your perspective on um, having street smarts um, and being competitive <clears throat> versus book smarts? It's a good question. I hadn't thought of that one, actually. Um, um, interesting enough, people think I am reasonably intelligent, I think. Um, but actually, that's not what I, uh, that's not what I um, uh, admire, uh, so to speak, about myself. Uh, I am extremely competitive. Um, I like to think that I, I have street smarts um, and I can, I can shuck it and jive with the best of the best. And so I can get into a meeting and hold my own with engineers on a topic. Uh, you know, we would have, for example, capital expansion meetings at Yahoo. One of the things we did, we created these, these set of meetings. So we would review deals on a weekly, a bi-weekly, bi-monthly basis. And uh, we review capital, get everybody together capital. Uh, every Friday at two o'clock, uh, and a lot of times I would challenge people. I say, "What's the what's the return? Why do you need this product? Why do you this or that?" And I, I wasn't afraid to do that. And so you have to mix it up, and and having that that ability to do that uh, is really really important. But you know, when I've seen studies, when you look at what is the the criteria for success and non-success, you look at sports. It's usually competitiveness. It isn't just talent. It's who can compete. You know. What makes LeBron so great? What makes uh, uh, Steph Curry so great? Is they're, they're just strong competitors. And I would say in business, it is street fighting. You know, it isn't just smarts. It, smarts is like table stakes. You have to have it. But more importantly, you have to be able to get things done. And there's so many people who have smarts, you know, may come from phenomenal schools and all this and have all the right, you know, they look great and all this good stuff, yeah. but they can't get things right. done. Right. So hiring people that can get things done uh, as, as you asked about street smarts, and have that compet that real hard-nosed competitive zeal to win. Right. Uh, I, that's what I find most important in people. Sure, sure. I'd like to pivot the conversation okay. here. I want to talk, tell me about your childhood. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? What was your family like? <clears throat> well, interestingly, I did a lot of my own. I, you know, um, 
Uh, I grew up in a little town called Peabody, Massachusetts, uh, about 15 miles north of Massachusetts. Um, interesting enough versus all the people around here, so to speak. I went to all public schools. Uh, so I went to, you know, uh, public uh, grade schools, public high schools, went to, um, uh, I took Hebrew uh, after school. Um, and um, yeah, I think in my high school, you know, I was highly uh, ranked, but only 15% of the people in my high school went to college. So it was, it was a very blue collar town. Um, <clears throat> but I, I had the internal desire to win, uh, honestly. Uh, I have worked pretty much all my life. I, I would mow lawns. I, I would uh, shovel snow in the winter. Uh, I would wash cars. The one job I never did, uh, I never, uh, I never sent, I did paper, I never was, did paper routes because I don't like get up early in the morning. I had that. So, so, so I never, I never did <laughs> I paper didn't. routes. I didn't want to do that because uh, I'm not a morning person. So I never, it was one thing I never did. Uh, but in terms of, uh, I started, geez, at 10, 12 years old, I would shovel snow, mow lawns, you know, do things to make, you know, some money. I, so I was always focused on being self-supportive, if you will. Uh, you know, my parents actually didn't push me. I, I was really... Uh, self, absolutely self-motivated. I was the oldest child of, of the three kids we had, uh, but I was motivated, and and um, and I grew up again, as I say, in a you know at best middle-class blue-collar town. Uh, but and I had the will to win. Uh, I, I I I when I <clears throat> when I did my applications for colleges, I, I did a whole bunch of colleges where you do <clears throat> safety schools, reach schools, and. In, in, in mid schools, and you know, I, I got into one of my reed schools. Cornell I was very happy. I went to engineering there, uh, and that was the furthest uh, west I had been. You know, having grown up because we didn't travel much as a family. You know, I really didn't do a lot of vacations and stuff, which is uh, sad because I think one of the things we try to do with our uh, we've tried to do with our kids is take them a lot yeah. of fun vacations, um, but we didn't do that. And so, um, you know, and, and my mother didn't even drive. If you can believe that, my, my, you know, she never drove. Uh, so, so we didn't have a, a lot of ability to go different places because she didn't drive. So, we, we, so I had a nice little community that, that where I grew up in. So we had a great group. Of, I had a great group of friends, uh, and, and my immediate friends did go to college. But in general, uh, matter of fact, we had, as I think about it, um, uh, we had we had so many students at one time because it was a budding population growth then. Because we had, we had double sessions in high school, so I actually had the, fortunately the, ha the afternoon session because uh, again I'm not a morning person. I remember even that now staying up late to watch Johnny Carson every night uh, in the old days because I could I didn't have to get up to the late morning. So, but I was very happy and um, and uh, you know went to school and uh, went to college and uh, worked and I went to business school. I see. Who was your favorite role model as a child, <coughs> and what made them special to you? Well, it's funny. Um, I was thinking about this. I, I didn't have a role model. Um, interesting enough. Um, what I was thinking about when I was a kid is I, I have to be a weather buff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would, interestingly enough, send them, um, actually it wasn't emails because you couldn't send emails, I would, I would write letters to some of the local uh, weather folks on air and they would actually send me all these maps and so forth. And, and so I, I really always had an innate sense and interest in, in weather, particularly bad weather. Nice. Uh, and the nice thing about growing up where I did is we had some really wicked uh, snowstorms, which I really enjoyed, actually, and even to this day, one of my, you know, if you look at what I uh, ask me, what I watch, I tend to watch news <coughs> news programs, I watch sports programs, and I watch weather. I'm one of these, uh, you know, guys that watch the Weather Channel. I love watching weather, and particularly when you have bad weather, I like seeing it, and I learn stuff. So weather is still, uh, so that was interesting enough. My my parents always thought I'd go into meteorology, which I didn't do. Uh, it was <coughs> it was an avocation. For me, but you know, so I didn't have, you know, um, I didn't have a mentor then. Uh, I did have a mentor though, though in, in when I, my first job, when I went to work for, my first job was Fairchild. And I always remember this because um, when I was graduating business school, uh, I, was, I interviewed with Fairchild and the corporate controller at the time, he interviewed me and he offered me a job on the spot and I always appreciate that and I ended up working for him. Actually, went to work for him at Fairchild, and another company, when he left there, and I stayed in touch with him until recently when he passed away. Uh, but he was a fabulous guy, a great mentor, and, and really helped up helped my career a lot. So that was my first, I would call it, real mentor. But as a kid, my mentor was quote unquote was watching, watching weather, weather and meteorology, and thinking but, about being meteorology. But did you did you always know <clears throat> that you wanted to end up in Silicon Valley? How did that happen? No, I didn't actually. What happened there? 
you know, interestingly enough is, <clears throat> you know, I went to school as an engineer and then I went to business school. Um, and, and then when I went to business school, interesting enough, I, I had a lot of job, I went to school at Harvard, I had a lot of job opportunities. I remember one was working in a refinery for Exxon and Aruba of all places. One was working for Xerox and, and, and up in Rochester, New York of all places. And a few other jobs were sort of off the, th you know, mainland, off the main ideas. Uh, but, you know, interesting enough, um, I had w uh, one job offer was what Fairchild in the West Coast. And I said to myself, you know, interesting enough, I, I, and I, this was back in the 70s, and I said, you know, I think, what I think technology is going to be blooming in Silicon Valley more so than the Boston Route 128 area. So I visualized a couple, three things. One is the activity would be out here. This was before it was obvious. And two is weather made a big difference, you know, and, and people would complain about weather uh, in the east and think all oh, the bad winters and the winters didn't bother me actually that much because I, I like cold I like going to ski and stuff, but it, it was the summers um, I said I was actually saying this to a friend the other day, you know you, you go through 10 to 12 weekends in the summer and half of them would be you know Your plans would get changed because the weather would be bad um, And and I'd see people come back to work on Monday sort of grumpy because what they planned on doing over the weekend You know playing golf whatever they couldn't do here, you know, for eight, yeah. nine months a year, you don't, weather is a non-factor, so you do what you want to do. So weather is a huge positive. So I came out here with the idea, <clears throat> this is where technology is going to be, and I knew I, I wanted to combine technology and finance. I, you know, I, I was good at numbers, uh, and so I learned, you know, accounting and finance at Harvard. I was good in engineering, <clears throat> I was good at numbers engineering as well. So I said, I want to combine working for an engineering company, uh, engineering-oriented company, technology company with being in finance. And so I, I, so I gravitated to fin the finance role and I wanted to work in technology. And I've been in technology ever since. And so that's how I thought about it. I, it, was a very thought, it was a very thoughtful actually as to saying I, I want to, I you know, and I, as I, said, I had no money. The only thing, position I had was a car, an old car. I had one friend out here that I knew from Cornell. So that was it in terms of, and I just literally packed my stuff in my car and I drove out here and I said, I'm gonna start, start new. All my family, still to this day, uh, in the East Coast, uh, but I'm going to go do my own thing, and that's how I, that's how I, how I did it, and I haven't looked back. That's fascinating. Very nice. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh. This meant a lot. You're not going to ask me about what I tell young. I want to ask. Yeah, oh yes, yes. I want one more because I. Okay. Yes. 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 Because <clears throat> I. You know, because I have, you know, when, when, <laughs> I'm going I'm to ask you a question to ask me. No, okay. what do I say, say to young folks? Because I, I, you know, I have three kids. Yeah. And one of the things I do think about. <clears throat> You know what you do today, and I would say that there's a different world today uh, than when I started. When I started, um, it was work, work, work. Um, you know, and, and and you know, I I remember when I met my wife, and I was doing the startup at Villasai, and you know, we, we wouldn't see each other much because we, uh, we I just worked, you yeah. know, and you know, I'd go in the office at eight o'clock, and I'd leave at eight or nine, ten o'clock at night, and did that and work all weekends, and yeah. you know, never thought about vacations. You know, we didn't have those. Um, the work-life balance is much more important in today's world. Uh, so I think, so you have to sort of moderate. <clears throat> so when companies think about the benefits, the work-life balance, but I say, I say to people, figure out where your passion is, figure out how you make a positive difference. Because I think it's really important you go and, you go do something that you really enjoy, that you're really passionate about, and where you can, you can make a difference. And, and I think about that. I think about, you know, even with what I just said, how can you work hard? Uh, so that you set a good example. I've tried to set. <clears throat> used to be as a when I first started, I would always be the first in, last out. I, I don't quite do that anymore. But I would really suggest to people, you know, and I tell my kids, I tell others, figure out how to work hard. Try not to do a lot of personal stuff. You know, with all the social stuff, it's easy to get distracted during the day. Try not to do too much of that during the office because you should be working. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, th I think I think actually some of the Millennials spend way, way too much time on, on things like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, what you, you name it, Snap. Uh, not that there's anything bad about them, but I think you can get overly, you know, uh, you can overly do work on those uh, and, and your phone. You may, you, all these alerts you get, I mean, I get, um, even while I'm sitting with you, I've probably felt my phone vibrate five or six times. <clears throat> so the, the alerts, the text message alerts, so you can just, you can get yourself so raptured. So, so to figure out how to, work and get yeah. things done and not get distracted but but work in a company where it's a good company 
is, is doing interesting stuff, not a me too company, uh, where you're working with you know, good people that can really guide you in your career. Uh, and as I say, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and you accomplish something. And, and just like I said earlier, you're not looking to change your job every couple of years. Um, easy for me to say, but don't worry about title or pay. And worry about experience. So I always tell people, think about how much experience you're getting because you will ultimately get rewarded for experience. You won't ultimately get rewarded necessarily for your title or for your compensation. So the more you get great experience, that will, that will provide your benefits then and down the road. Uh, and, and then look for companies where you, you admire the CEO, it's, 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 it's run well. Uh, look for where the action is. Right. Uh, you know, I've gone, if you look at my career, I started in semiconductors, uh, I went to database software, which was, which was interesting. I went into um, uh, internet at at home. Uh, I went into, um, you know, application software at Siebel. I went into security, you know, which is a big area, and I went back into internet. So I've always tried to figure out what, what is the, what is the area of things most happening? Because if you're in an area where there's a lot going on, a couple of things happen. One is uh, there's a lot of money going in that industry. And if you want to change over time, it's easy to go to another company because you're already in an area of, of expertise that's important. Right. So figure out, re, you know, what's the, you know, and today, the good thing about today, there's probably at least a dozen area with a lot going on. People talk about AI, machine learning, uh, SaaS, and uh, autonomous cars. There's just so much going on right. today. But figure out some area that is really happening uh, and go there. Uh, this, so I, I really say, think about that as you're coming out, as opposed to a Me Too company, as opposed to going just whether you think the, the compensation is good, mm -hmm. or you like your title. Go where you, go where, figure out a good company, uh, run by a good CEO, and where you, you can learn a lot, uh, maybe you're mentored, and if you do all that, that will come back to you in spades over time. Sure. So that's Makes what sense. I would say. Thank you so much. Thanks. It was wonderful getting to know more about you. And gosh, I hope I get to see more well, of you Well, I'm future. not. I, I would just say this. One last line. Yeah. Uh, I will never say, I will never, so actually a recruiter told me this when I talked to him. Uh, you will never see me when I leave a job, use re retired. I don't want anyone to do a search of me and say I'm retired. <laughs> I am not retiring. Uh, I do have a good balance in life, by the way. Um, now, I, one of the things I do enjoy is, is the ability to work. And again, I'm doing a, a family office now. Uh, as you know, um, but I, I have a lot of avocations. I like skiing. Uh, I actually learning how to kiteboard. Spent a few weeks in the summer wow. kiteboarding, yeah. uh, playing a little golf. So I have all these things I really enjoy doing. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. So so I'm able to work and, and, and actually have some other avocations which really keep me going. Yeah, that's fantastic. So that's what I really enjoy. That's great. So, and, fantastic. I, and I would say the most the, the biggest fun I had. And the, the biggest accomplishment I have and the biggest thing I'm excited about is, is now learning and actually getting decent at kiteboarding, which I did over the summer. You're amazing. So that's, that's You're my... You're truly amazing. That's where I leave. Okay, thank yeah. you. You're, thank you're too you nice. so much. You're too kind. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Folks, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.